Go. Hi, my name is Scott Fuchs. I'd like to say thanks for the opportunity to present uh, on a topic that uh, um, I, I guess I've done quite a few of these actually right now, but we're going to talk about wide zone uh, today. A lot of these clips are still from Buffalo, uh, uh, the last school that I was at. Um, but as we kind of get into this, um, you know, all this stuff still pertains to the technique that we're doing. And uh, I'm going to start this off a little bit at the beginning here talking about some fundamental stuff uh, that we really incorporate every single day no matter what scheme uh, we are running no matter it's pass or run it really doesn't matter uh, these are the five fundamentals that that we will work every day so we try to keep things simple uh, in, in uh, our indie uh, try not to get too I guess creative in the stuff that we're doing unless the guy's pretty advanced with his technique right now but um, number one on here is stance and start when we talk stance and start and that's gonna be a big part of the wide zone uh, cut up that we're talking about uh, we're simply talking about our angle of departure and our line of force and our line of force would be defined basically where's my center of mass moving to okay where are my hips moving are they always moving towards a defender or are they moving around a defender are they moving laterally i always want to be moving my line of force towards the defender so we'll talk about that a little bit more um, as we get into the clinic hands being inside i think that's a little bit deceiving uh certainly want hands inside we talk a lot about tight elbows um it doesn't have to be both hands i guess i'd say it that way one hand inside is a is a big deal uh, so it could be hand inside or hands inside um, just so that's not mis miscommunicated there um, number three, feet apart, wide base, um, definitely a fundamental of all blocking and I think everybody can agree with that. Uh, but one thing about uh, running a wide zone play, you might actually end up running quite a bit, so where that wide base fits in, uh, there are certainly parts uh, of, of how we do things that, that fits in as well. Uh, butt down, the last two, number four and five, kind of deal with with leverage so when we talk about butt being down we're talking really our vertical leverage to the defender um, it might be where we strike the defender but to be quite honest um, I use this this uh, analogy I guess a 610 uh, tackle versus a six foot uh, center are probably going to have two different versions of having your butt down or your pads down we don't really say pads down but uh, two, two different versions of that so uh, the idea here is uh, being able to play with, with knee bend where I can translate the force of my hips into the block. Okay, so I can, I can use my body, uh, use my hips, and, and really work them through the defender. Uh, so that's where vertical leverage comes into play. And then the last one, hat placement. Uh, we, talk about, uh, we talk about that in terms of horizontal uh, leverage, meaning if I'm just looking right down on the field and it's two-dimensional, basically keeping my hat between the defender and the ball. And I think the next slide here, I'm gonna talk about these two uh, leverage concepts because I want my guys to understand this so we're speaking the same language at the end of the day. It, it's not like they gotta be able to give a clinic on it or anything like that, but uh, when we talk vertical leverage here, okay, it refers to the leverage you have on the defender, your ability to lower your center mass and allow you to transition your hips through the block just reading that off to you but it's three-dimensional so we will look at every defender as a cylinder okay uh, the old Howard Mudd analogy so where his arms are where his chest is we don't really want to say get your whatever to the far number you may not be presented with the far number uh, so at the end of the day we're just talking about the cylinder of the body you might be striking him from the side a little bit at an angle um, so we try to keep that simple uh, where they strike um, and then horizontal leverage, like I said, and I don't know, can you see this, Jimmy? Yep. Okay, so the, the picture here, all right, is looking down on the field, the ball direction is the same, but really keeping my body or my hat between the defender and the ball, knowing where the ball is going, okay, or I should say having an idea, because truthfully, you probably don't really always know where the ball is going to go, uh, but maintaining and keeping horizontal leverage throughout the play, uh, we'll tell them we want them to finish. Uh, but beyond finish, finishing in a dominant position would be finishing with good horizontal leverage. If I'm finishing in a dominant position, I will always maintain my body between the defender and the ball carrier, and he should never be a part of the tackle. Um, easier said than done, obviously. But 
this in and of itself, like how we take off uh, our stance and start the angle of departure, those things are critical in maintaining good horizontal leverage. Um, and I think if you ask my, any of my guys, I'd, I'd, they'd be able to tell you, yeah, that is, that is important. You, you put yourself in a bad position right away, you're going to be struggling the entire play uh, to regain leverage or just gain leverage to, uh, to keep, a, keep the guy blocked. So these two concepts we do talk about quite a bit, um, and they do understand them, and they understand um, you know, if they're watching themselves or watching somebody else, they're able to coach each other up. I like having this. Um, as part of what we do, just having more coaches on the field, letting those guys kind of explain to each other what they see and what they're doing wrong. Um, so this drawing here um, represents really a concept drawing of what we're trying to do with our wide zone play. So our wide zone play, uh, the aiming point, okay, the ball, the aiming point is the tight end or the ghost tight end. That's the track of the running back. Um, and I'm not going to get too much into out of gun or pistol or under center in the dot, anything like that. But generally speaking, we understand where the aiming point is. So we understand where linebacker flow will be. What we need to do to down linemen, that's kind of really what the diagram talks about. So I have a, a line here that just represents we want to cut the defense at some point somewhere. Um, doesn't necessarily have to be that spot, but the defense needs to be cut like any, any play you run in offense. The play side guys, and we consider the play side guys, are the play side tackle and the play side guard. Okay, the center will be part of the backside blocking. I'll talk about that in a second. But these two guys are the play side guys. So they need to create distortion. They got to move people, move defenders off the line of scrimmage. They've got to widen defenders. Um, and these arrows kind of show. Okay, let's. This would be awesome if we did this every time. That's that's pretty rare. We can we can get them running, get them widening. Uh, even if the tackle had something upfield and he widened that, uh, we would take that as acceptable. Talking about the backside blocking, though, uh, center, backside guard, backside tackle, all these guys, we allow them to basically get depth, okay, give up ground to gain leverage, okay, gain horizontal leverage. So if I had something in the A gap, I'm going to allow that center to skip out, at least out of the gun, skip out, get depth, get leverage and try to reach up whatever he has there. And that could even be a three technique, depending on how the three technique is playing it and moving him back into the, uh, from the B gap into the A gap. On the back side here, kind of similar, and we broke this down a little bit more. I'm gonna get into that as we talk here. Uh, if I have a B gap defender on the back side, we'd love to create distortion off of that with the guard and the tackle. We can do that because we're not really using the guard to look for a play side shade. If the play side shade were to slant back, the, the, you know, the center, is uh, he owns that. And then the backside guard is really working to our minus one and the center is working to our mic in, in all these cases. So how this works for us is, uh, I, I guess going back to Buffalo when we started doing this, didn't really realize that the center was part of the backside blocking, but the more you watch it and, and the more you look at it, you say, okay, that, that kind of makes sense. Creating distortion, gaining leverage, Cutting the defense. That's that's basically the gist of it. I know it's a little bit busy here. I should talk about this too. Any penetration in the B gap or C gap is kind of a play killer for us a little bit. So moving on. Um, so this clinic is broken down into what the play side tackle does, what the play side guard does, what the center does, what the backside guard does, and then what the backside tackle does. And then there's video after each of these clips. Um, and some of these things are going to be the same. Uh, you can imagine, I guess, for the place I guard and the place I tackle, but I want to elaborate on a few things. I think this looks pretty busy. It could actually be, even be a little bit more simple. So when we talk core aiming point, uh, right here, middle of the cylinder with your hat in front of the defender. So really the place I tackle, anything in the C gap, okay? Uh, now he might have a tight end working with him in line. Tight end might be backed off. He might be no tight end at all and working to the open side. Uh, but any defender in the C gap is going to be middle of the cylinder. Now how we get to that guy is going to vary. All right, so we're talking a play side blocker, which is our tackle here, with a guy in his play side gap, okay? And I'll get to a backside gap uh, point in here a little bit. But he's going to skate or open his hip to run. So his angle of departure is created by opening up his hip, all right? I simply tell them we're going to drop our heel, 
Okay, I don't want to get too elaborate on that, but we call it a skate. You can call it anything you want, um, but it's simply opening up the hip, creating an angle to the middle of the cylinder. Now, is he going to run on that? Depending on the width of the defender, if he's going out to a wide five, yeah, he's got to close ground, he's got to run, okay? And we want him running right at it. We don't want him taking an angle where he's, we say, slipping our hips. So I'm kind of sweeping my hip across and almost looks like I'm trying to reach a guy up. We don't want to reach the guy up, okay? Um, I believe that when you wheel on a guy or reach him up, uh, something like that's going to happen naturally. All right, we really just want the guy to expand and run fast and try to keep his gap. All right, if he wants to fall inside um, uh, or late kind of work inside, then that half that wheel happens and we reach him up. That's great. Okay, we're, we're staying on that guy. If he were to slant inside immediately, we're going to pass that off to the guard. Uh, we're going to stuff it back to the guard and work up to our linebacker. Um, so. Going through the footwork again without being able to see my feet in this, which I don't know if you'd be able to see them anyway at a live clinic, but um, creating that angle departure right down the middle of the cylinder is critical. No, and I'm talking right down the middle of the cylinder. I'm not aiming to the front of the guy. I'm not aiming where I think he's going to be going. I'm going right to the middle of the guy no matter how wide he is, no matter how tight he is. Okay. And again, if he is really tight, I'm probably not opening up my hip and running. I might end up having a wide base there because I'm going to have to strain at that moment to get him moving, okay? And then the last point on is talk about not slipping the hip. Um, you know, we, 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 you can think of it like, because I've heard a lot of people say it this way, like you want a uh, knee to the crotch of the defender or step on his down hand. I think there's a lot of different ways you can say it to a kid where he can visualize and see that and then, and then really go and attack it, all right? So without talking about the backside guy, hand placement, we're really talking about our inside hand, so if I'm talking about a right tackle, it would be my left hand. All right? Uh, we'll call, call it our power hand or inside hand. We want it to the armpit of the defender and, and have a tight elbow. We don't want any elbow flaring as I'm going to block this. I want this, this tight elbow. Now, here's the thing about this. If the guy's really tight, I might fit it up with two hands and have my head outside. If he's really wide, it might end up being one. If it is just one hand, though, there's a potential for that guy to work too far past the defender. So we'd love to get a good fit, meaning both hands, just power elbow really tight in there, all right? Um, if I tell them they need to get their power hand to the armpit every single time, they're going to try and do that. So at the end of the day, if it's anything on the core, all right? We, I don't really want the shoulder. It might be the shoulder and elbow. That's where it goes. That's where it goes. But we're really trying to get to the core uh, the, on the cylinder, basically the cylinder of the guy, right? Um, the outside the defender. We certainly want to protect the chest. We don't want to have this outside hand flailing around. We want to get it fit in there. Backside, so if I'm a play side blocker and I have a guy in the B gap and nothing outside of that, now we just refer to it as like a drag hand like you would in, in pass blocking, okay? And sometimes that drag hand can be really physical, uh, depending on where our linebacker's at, how we're going to climb to him. Uh, if the linebacker is already kind of wide, that drag hand might be not as physical, it might be just putting it out there, making sure that guy's not attacking me, okay? I don't want to take off and have some guy hit me in the shoulder and knock me off a block, so I'm always going to use a drag hand uh, with these, these play side guys that have an inside shade or shade inside of them, okay? So how thick or thin we work this four eye is based on where our linebacker is at. If he's tucked inside, it's obviously going to be really thick, and we're working together again with the guard. If he is loose, maybe he's stacked in a 40 over me, maybe he's a little bit wider, that's probably going to be a little bit more thin, okay? Just based on the angle of our running back and where he's going. So coaching points here, I might have already covered a few of these anyway, but win with speed. So whatever we do, um, whatever the defensive end is taught to do, and that might be to, to lever the play, uh, maybe fall inside, maybe he doesn't have to lever it. Whatever he has to do, we want him to have to do it faster than he wants to do it, okay? I don't want to give that, especially with the play side blockers, we're talking guards and tackles with a play side a defender in their gap. Um, run, to, I mean, we're exploding out of our stance, make them have to do whatever he's doing, do it really fast. I want them to know they're always protected by the play side guard, but that doesn't give them, um, I guess, license to just let the guy go inside, okay? Uh, we want to attack him and we want to move him. We obviously got to strike him pretty low. Uh, but we're, I'm going to tell the tackle and, and potentially the guard here, but the tackle for sure, even though the play side guard is protecting you, that you're going to protect yourself 
simply by a good angle of departure. All right. If I'm working right at the guy as fast as I can and he is sticking or he's slanting inside, I can still get a hand on that, use that hand to adjust, stuff the guy back inside. It might slow me down, it might turn my shoulders back, that's fine, okay? And then find my backer and go. Uh, but I can protect myself versus an inside move and protect the guard as well just by my angle of departure, okay? If he goes inside, um, pass the defender. If you, excuse me, if he's slanting inside, we, we want to pass him inside. We don't just want to run away from him and say, okay, great, the guard's got him. I think that is, that's a big issue for that guard. He can't get that done. Um, torquing a defender out, okay? So I already talked about wheeling on a guy or reaching him up happily naturally. I don't want to go out and block the end and just manhandle him and torque him out. You might have a guy that can literally do that and he's just stronger and better than everybody else. Um, it seems like no matter what though, if I when I did teach to torque a guy out, that's all they tried to do. And now you're not letting that play kind of happen naturally. If the guy wants to go outside and I can feel it and I can just torque him and get him upfield and create that bigger space for the running back, I want to go ahead and do that. But I certainly don't want to be trying to do that over and over again. I think that creates more issues. Um, and then protecting your chest. Uh, one of the worst things, I guess, early on, about four years ago when I was running a lot of this, guys just coming out of their stance and standing up, getting their, I mean, defenders are taught to strike your chest right now, so we got to get to their chest, obviously, but protect your chest by keeping your chest low, uh, keeping your hands inside. Those are key points for us as well. So the playside guard is going to have some similar things on this, but let's get to the, I'll get to the film on what the tackle is doing here. I think we're talking right tackle, um, and it's taking a little bit of time to get lined up here for these guys, but He's got a guy that's a little bit tight. He kind of crosses the, the inside foot over, which I'm not too excited about because that's kind of flat. But he does get his left hand close to the armpit here. And that's what we're looking for. The guy's trying to kind of peek inside and fall inside. So here the wheel is happening, uh, what we'd say is naturally for him. Okay. Next clip, I believe, is the left tackle right here. All right. This one is a little bit loose. You can tell, I mean, his, his hat gets in front, his hand's in good shape, might be a little bit long with the second step, but I think a lot of good things are going here. I just think he's a little bit loose on his core aiming point going to the middle of the cylinder here. So as this guy kind of gets widened, he uses that to fall back, uh, toss the tackle aside and fall back inside. I think I got another one on here that's, that's pretty good, but this is a good job of just expanding that defensive end right away. Okay. You see these all right? Okay. I think I got left tackle again, a little bit tighter on this one, and probably doing a better job of using his outside hand, his left hand in this case, where he fits up this block. And now as the guy tries to fall inside, he still can maintain or stay on that block. He does a pretty decent job of that. I know some of these aren't probably the best clips at all, but just going through and grabbing some really quick uh, at Buffalo, uh, I thought he did a pretty nice job there. Okay. This one is right tackle again, all right. Now we got a guy that's kind of tight. Again, we cross over a little bit more than I want, but he does get going, and I think he fits this pretty good. I, I guess if I try to freeze it here, I think he's fit pretty well. Inside hand tight, outside hand still on the core, hat getting to the outside. So he's creating that situation where that guy's got to try and play that block even peek inside, but he can't peek inside and just keeps him expanding and expanding. Uh, I like that. He and it basically gets to the point where he gives up on the on the play. All right. So that's a nice job by the tackle there. Uh, might be just one more here. Let's see. Left tackle again. Okay, so here's a great example. Like if you look at this, say, well, hey, coach is half positions inside and stuck on this. I'm going to tell you, you got, got to fall back on this a little bit. Like, I know I gave a lot of detail as to what's supposed to happen there, but probably the major one on the whole thing is just really win with speed at the end of the day. So he's really fast. The guy's starting to get up, uh, up field. His half position's where it's at. He can't change that. He's just got to try and continue to expand the guy and win on the block. And he does a nice job of that and takes him. And this might be a case where it even starts to become a torque where he's torquing him outside, but does a really nice job of taking that guy and making him expand. And so wherever the hat position goes, I'm not going to say, hey, that's a shitty job. That's a great job by him, okay, and getting out and doing that. So 
where you strike the guy, where your hand position, position is, we know where we want it to be, we know where the hand wants to be, we know how we want the feet to be, but at the end of the day, if what they can do is produce with speed, that's probably the biggest takeaway uh, from the play side guys that, that I could give you. All right, so the play side guard having some of the similar, actually really similar thoughts because again, just a play side guard or tackle, we'll call them the play side guys. Uh, he's got a B gap defender and, it, and that B, B, he can be wider uh, than the middle of the cylinder because the center protect you. So his aiming point, he can cheat a little bit is what I say. That's maybe a little bit more advanced, but I do like the fact that he cheats it a touch because if we get like a pirate uh, or something where a three were to go inside and end was coming, we need to be able to pick up the defensive end at that point. So we do let him cheat a little bit and it's easier for the center, at least when the center's skipping out, to basically pick up any three technique moving inside. And once a three technique gets himself to the A gap again, now he's a part of the backside and we're hoping we're getting that reached up. So we can loosen up his aiming point a little bit that way. We, he still wants a hat in front of the defender. You know, one thing, and I, I think I have it in here, skate or open up the hip to run depending on how wide he is. If he's a four eye, I guess I want to I want to talk about this in here, creating a departure of that slightly in front, uh, don't slip the hip to six hip. So here's what I want to say about this. If it's a four eye, I get a lot of guards that think I need to get around this and reach this up and that is absolutely not what we're trying to do with a four eye, with a three technique. Again, we're trying to make that expand, okay? So we think about what the tackle's doing, he's either thick or thin on a four eye, um, he might actually be working out past the four eye depending on you know what, what the play is. But I want that guard to attack the middle of the cylinder always. So the wider that defender gets, like from a tight three technique, he goes to a wide four eye, wide on the guard at least. He's a, he's a four eye. I want him a, just attacking the crap out of the middle of the cylinder, make that guy play that fast. I, you know, you probably don't get a lot of long stick out of four eye. It can certainly happen. Um, but at the end of the day, that angle should not be in front of the four eye. We're not trying to reach that up. Again, we're trying to attack it and make it, make it expand fast, okay? And these are the same points. Don't slip the hip. Uh, don't cross over. It's probably a better way to say it. Don't take a skate and kind of cross over and have my uh, line of force going lateral. I want to go in at the defender. Hand placement, again, is very similar. Um, probably exactly the same. Big up defender, power hands inside, and we want the armpit outside hand. Any A-gap defender, this is a similar thing now for, the, for what we said with the tackle with the four-eye, any A-gap defender I have, so we'll say anything head up, like a two technique to a two-eye on inside, as he is working out of there, he's going to use a drag hand. Now, that's where footwork, I want to talk about that real quickly. If I have a backside A-gap defender, and I apologize that it doesn't have it on here, but if I do have like a, a two-eye and then a five technique on the tackle, that's what I'm going to use basically a skate stab. I'm going to have my wide base at that point because I don't know what the two I want to do. Does he want to slant outside? If it's a two technique, does he want to go inside or outside? All these things. So I'm going, to, I'm going to open up the hip. I'm going to get the second step down in the ground. I'm going to be kind of powerful there and just feel what's going on. It's going to slow me down just a touch, but I have some time. Okay. If that guy wants to come with me and get in the gap, I want to accelerate him. If he wants to hang back there, I'm just body presence now for the center kind of bind him a little bit of time as I'm continuing to work my angle of departure, whether that's to the defensive end or uh, moving on to my linebacker, okay? So how you use your footwork there, it's not always just what's in the A gap. There might not be, excuse me, what's in the B gap. There might not be anything in the B gap. It might just be sitting back there, like I said, head up in front of me or a two eye or something even in the gap. I've got to protect myself. Uh, again, just like pass pro, we call it a drag hand and we don't want to get let anything get on our shoulder. We want to be using our hands with all this stuff. So, in the coaching points, I kind of already hit some of this stuff. The wider the big gap defender, the more the aim point becomes the middle of the cylinder. Attack, attack, attack on that. Um, the three steps, kind of the golden rule, I think everybody that I've ever talked to about the play, you kind of get three steps to figure out if you're going to uh, reach the guy up. We'll say a guard versus a five technique and the five technique legs. Am I going to, or slants inside, am I reaching him up? Am I hammering him to the outside, or am I just free climbing to linebacker? So the two scenarios that are really simple, guy slants at you, he's mine, I take him, okay? Guy runs away from me, hip is gone, I'm climbing the linebacker, 
probably don't need a lot of practice at that. Okay, figuring that out. I think those things are kind of, uh, well, they're not, not that you don't practice them, but, but really where you get the issues is the gray area where the guy is kind of like on the backside hip of, of the covered guy and he's kind of hanging there. So really want to stress this, when do I get my eyes on the backer? So, and I, I think I have some video uh, of this too. I have nothing in my A gap, or excuse me, my B gap, and I'm taking off. All of a sudden, the defensive end kind of lags, and he's sitting there. As soon as I put my hands on him, I'm not just knocking the shit out of him necessarily. I put my hands on him, my eyes immediately go to my backer. What's my backer doing? Is he running over the top? He's running over the top. I want to hammer the down guy. If he's lagging behind, potentially trying to run through, I'm just going to come off and pick up the backer. So. I will have to look at the down guy as I'm getting my hands to him. As soon as my hands are on him, I'm going to peek that backer. Peek might be a bad word, but I'm going to stare that backer down and feel the down guy. Okay, so we're talking a guard working to a five technique that's kind of lagging. Or, or you shoot even a four technique that's kind of hanging there, and he's just trying to play the back shoulder of the tackle. Um, getting those eyes to backer as soon as you touch that down guy, I think, is a critical coaching point. Um, the other thing, angle climb the linebacker, keeping leverage always. Uh, and this is going to come up now, this, this point right here, how I climb to backer. A lot of young kids feel like, okay, I've got leverage, now I'm going to turn north and go get the guy, and the play's going to continue on, and you'll get beat every time. It's really frustrating. So we tell them, no matter what play side or back side, as I'm climbing to backer, okay, if we're both running together, I'm just going to use one hand, I'm going to put that one hand out there and start that way, okay? I got the one hand, now he's falling back, now I come back with two hands. He wants to run over the top, I got the one hand on him and I just keep running. It maybe goes to two hands, but it's always going to start with one hand on the backer. Sometimes they have a good feel like they don't get the hand on him, but they get up there and the backer kind of sits and they want to put two hands on him. But as, as we're talking about a guy that's running now, we're going to use one hand to feel that out before we ever try to put two hands out there. Okay. And then the last one on there, which I guess I kind of alluded to a little bit, your drag hand can turn into a pillar, something that is a little bit more physical based on if that 2i or the a gap guy wants to cross your face or really attack you you need to protect yourself there so a couple good clips of some of this stuff in here i believe i think we're looking at the left guard here maybe All right, so enough indicators here. I'm sure that these guys were all talking about these linebackers being up, up in the box here in the A gap. So having this 2i, and this is a pretty smart guy, uh, he realized this guy's probably got to be a, a B gap defender based on where the linebackers are getting ready to pressure here. So he kind of takes off, he puts the one hand on him, and he's able to run. He doesn't use two hands, he doesn't turn his shoulders north. So that keeps him from getting beat the whole time here. Eventually, the guy kind of peeks back, falls back two hands, goes back to one hand on this and just runs with him on one hand. I think this is smart stuff right here, okay? His ability just, I know I'm between him and the ball right now. I've got good horizontal leverage and I'm gonna keep that the whole time. Defender has a hard time getting off that. That's, that's a really good clip of that happening right there. Um, this one, I don't wanna be in the way of the camera, you good? You're good. Okay. All right, so we had a pretty decent idea of some of this stuff happening, but here's the three technique, not slanting inside, and the defensive end kind of working inside. But one thing I want to mention about this, I, I think this is important because of what the running back is taught. Once the defensive end goes inside, the back is going to go outside. I mean, that, that's his read key at the end of the day. So I run into a lot of um, we'll say young guys, you guys that have run the play before, as soon as that guy comes in, they, they hit it and try to knock it out totally against what you want to do there. You're not going back into where the running back's going. So if anything, we want to soften. Um, we can rip. Um, we can wipe. Um, we can, you know, scoop them up and excuse me, scoop them up and take them inside with our outside hand. So I don't care how they do it. They just know when the guy comes inside, he's got to stay inside because the back is going out there. So I think in this case, he kind of, he sees it, gets his head outside, probably even rips a little bit. And I'm not saying the back went to the right place or not, but I think there's probably a better hold to the outside here uh, at the end of the day. But that's a good job by him uh, keeping that 
defensive end inside. Um, next clip is okay. The right guard here. Okay. Now, how loose this guy gets and how much he wants to really look at that, this might be a case where the tackle and tight end are just going to work this by themselves. And now he's got this tube technique. He's going to drag him. But his linebacker is plussed over enough, okay, to where he's going to say, I probably got to get moving here pretty quick on this. So there's a good skate. He's got the hand on the guy. He can separate. And as he separates, kind of slows down. We'll say the nose with the D tackle there. Ends up picking him up with two hands, which is fine, because he strikes him at the right spot and then widens him out there. And then give, basically gives enough for the, for the center to get in here and get a little rip and create a seam in there. Again, wherever they decide to go is right to me, but I know that we're trying to give him as many options as possible as we do this, okay? Uh, I believe I'm going back to the right guard here. Okay. All right, so here's another scenario. Same thing, we have two linebackers up in here, safeties down low, so we know we're running this into a pressure. And just by pure film study, we know that this guy, he's gonna go inside and this guy's gonna play the B-gap at that point. So he does a good job of gaining some leverage on this. And what he does here is, I know he's got his right hand in there, but then he decides to rip and kind of turns it into a butt block. Again, just a really good understanding of horizontal leverage. Okay, this guy is stuck in here. I'm just going to keep him in there. And as he tries to fall off his back end, he just pushes back with his butt and keeps the hole open that way. So as long as we keep moving, we have a rip in there and everybody's kind of tied up. And I don't necessarily, I suppose you get called for holding. I, I don't really see it that way. They didn't, they didn't see it that way either. So but we're, we're all good. I like what he did here to try and finish this block. You know, his, his finish move, get it to a rip and get his butt back in there and keep him from coming off his, his backside. Okay. So for our center, our center technique uh, is a little bit different now. If we're under center, um, you know, we can't necessarily skip out. But if we are in pistol or in the gun or something like that, he does have the ability to skip out um, based on, I guess, what, what he has for defense. So we're going to try and gain leverage on any A-gap defender or B-gap defender and try to get our head outside with the center. So when I say B-gap defender, I mean like a three technique that wants to lag and come inside and just hang there. Uh, maybe play off the backside hip of the guard uh, or anything that's sliding inside of the A-gap. Uh, we we want to gain leverage on that. So our footwork is we're going to skip out to any, this, is the, this was the rule to start off with, skip out to any defender that's too wide to reach up immediately, a two wide or wider. So if we thought, you know what, we're going to need some depth to gain leverage on this guy, let's skip out. Let's use that. And really, the gun snaps ended up being a lot better, too. There, there wasn't a lot of turning. Um, now, again, you're under center. You're, you're not going to do that. I, I, we, we messed around with it a little bit, and maybe you could get away with it. But uh, guys that are going to kind of jump reach, or you got to give up a little ground if that guy's kind of attacking you. you got to do something to gain leverage on that guy. So we're just going to do it immediately. Now, uh, it, it's kind of self-explanatory. Um, and it kind of talks about those scenarios there, but I, I do like our ability to, get, I guess, do both things, whether we're just going to open up skate and open up and go get the guy, or if we're going to skip out, um, whatever the, the, the young man might feel comfortable with. Um, and then as he goes here, um, I was just talking about hands. Again, hand placement, hands on core. We want to rip the ripper. I, I think you saw that on that last clip with the, uh, with the guard. I guess he didn't really get a ripper. But if a, if a guy's going to rip and run, we know he's at all costs. He's going to run. He wants to run and get to that gap. So as soon as he rips, I need to rip. And now that's the only time I'm going to put that guy on my shoulder. So that happens sometimes with a 2I uh, that might be wanting to you know, take a bad step. And then he's got to regain and get back out to uh, probably the B gap at that point. Uh, with a zero nose, I like this coaching point, but I'm going to snap the ball and my backside hand is going to go to the throat. Okay, somewhere in here we're trying to get to the chest, uh, the core with the backside hand. That probably is a little bit more physical. We're trying to buy a little bit more time for the backside guard if we end up getting a zero nose. Okay, so some coaching up points on here that I may have talked about already, but your man on any defender that crosses your face, do not have the, I, I do not want the backside guard looking for a tight shade cross the face. Now I will tell you, if we get a 100% uh, 
indicator that, hey, when the guy's lined up like this, he's going to cross face, we'll bring the backside guard with us. So that, that stuff would certainly show up. Um, but at the end of the day, when that A-gap guy slants the backside A-gap, place that A-gap, slants it, or shoot, he might be a two technique and he wants to slant to the backside A-gap, we have all day to really come back and pick him up because he's taking himself out of the play, uh, so to speak, and we're probably running that into a pressure, which we would like anyway. Um, but I don't want the backside guard slowed down looking for that stuff happening. I want him playing fast, and I want the backside tackle playing fast as we get to our backside linebacker, which we call the minus one. Um, so I don't want, I just want the center to know you, you have that guy, man. If you feel like you stay, your hands stay down the whole time, then just turn back and, and keep him stuck back there. If he slanted so far where you couldn't even touch the guy, just leave him and go. Just leave him and go because he's going to run into the backside guard anyway, and something like that's going to happen natural. Uh, must be able to gain the depth to create leverage to reach up the place at A-gap. We talked about that. Running the nose past the read point of the running back. So if, I, if I'm on the backside and I got a guy that's going to rip and run, I need to accelerate him faster than he wants to go. So I accelerate him past where the tight end was or the ghost tight end, and now the running back can cut behind that. Okay, But I need to get that going very fast if he is running. I'm always protecting the play side guard as a center. Again, the same rule goes in here. Three steps to overtake, hammer, or climb, and knowing when my eyes go on my backer. Okay. The angle climb rule is the same, uh, using one hand as I get there, and only drag hand to protect ourselves. So I know we could probably do some, some scenarios where we man up the play side guard and tackle and use the backside guard to kind of cut the defense at a backside shade. Uh, and we don't really get involved with that because at the end of the day, if we keep it the same all the time, this is what we do. We try to find the best spots to run it at. Uh, but he's only going to protect himself. He's not really sticking that backside shade so the guard can get there. He's just protecting himself so that guy doesn't jump on his shoulder as he's trying to get out of there. So I think we have a couple decent clips. We got some zero nose clips in here too of the center. Uh, starting off with the zero nose here. Uh, let's see here. So here's a good good clip. Now he's not skipping out, obviously he doesn't need to with the zero in and any shade that's tighter, but as I get here, he has the ability, I wish I could get, he has the ability to release off this because his hand is right to the neck there. So I have the one hand in there. If I need to release it, I can. If I need to get thick, I can. Does a nice job helping out with the backside guard. You can see the backside guard has to rip and kind of run with this guy. And now we get on the linebacker and we can run him wider. So that's, that's a really nice job by the center on this one. So we get to a shade nose here, and he got really into the point where he was probably going to skip everything. Uh, and I don't know that he would need to skip out on this, but he does get the depth. You can see he does get the depth that he needs, and his hand placement is in the core. So once he gains the depth, you can kind of jump turn on the guy, keep him stuck inside. That's a really nice job of shutting down uh, the nose in this case, and I think the nose is doing a decent enough job working to the play side. But here, at the end of the you look at this guy, he's going to peek inside like, okay, is this guy going to fall back? And as soon as he does that, uh, the center does a nice job of just keeping him stuck in there. This is to, I would say, a two technique or a two eye, uh, skipping out to get depth to this. Uh, the guy kind of gives up on, on the block or on, on defending the play, honestly. But just any little false step, he's going to take this false step to the inside. Gain leverage, shut it down. It's a really nice job by the center there, just stopping the flow at that point. Okay. And got another, let's see, I got a shade nose, a two technique. Here's another shade nose, zero. Okay. Here's another good look at the zero. Uh, I want to make this point as well. When we have a zero and a four eye, something like this, that, that's wide like that, the, the play side guard's now responsible if this guy were to long stick. We don't want the center looking out here while he was working the nose and having to get to, in this case, uh, the backer that's sitting backside. So he's strictly working with the backside guard in this case. And he does a nice job of using, again, he uses the one hand. He has the ability to turn, buy some time for the, uh, for the guard, and gets up there and shuts down the, the linebacker as well.
So it's a nice job of him getting around it. And again, using the one hand of the throat. It's good stuff. I think this is probably the best clip. I think we lose our guard on this, but this is a good clip here of talking about hammer and climbing. As soon as he gets hands on the defender, eyes go to linebacker. This linebacker looks like he's about to run through. He doesn't run through, so he pops over the top, and this, this could have been kind of bad if, if the center just gave up on and just tried, excuse me, gave, gave up on the down guy and tried to work the linebacker. But his eyes go there, he tries to go over the top, and then he just says, okay, the guy's going over the top, now I'm just going to hammer the guy and try to finish this off. You'd like to obviously keep the guard, guard's feet and get off that. He needed to use his hands a little bit better there. He just kind of got his elbow stuck in there, so he's in a little bit of trouble. And... That's it for the center. Backside technique now, going through what the center does, it's going to be pretty similar uh, to what the backside guard and, and tackle are doing. Um, I want to oversimplify this just a little bit for you guys. Um, and I'll, then I'll get into the, the detail, the minutia of some of the technique. If the backside guard or the backside tackle has a guy lined up in the play side gap, okay? So if I'm running the play to the right and I'm the left guard and I got a guy in that gap, okay? I'm going to get depth some way, somehow to gain leverage to cut the guy off, okay? My core aiming point cannot, it just can never be at the guy, okay? If I'm going at the guy, I'm beat right now. I'm going to give up ground in some way, shape, or form. I do like skipping out, but I'm telling you right now, they have to learn how to skip out with speed. If they're not going to do it with lightning speed, then we just got to open up the hip flat, get depth, and, and get moving on that. But speed, speed is where you went on the backside, just like you went on the play side. If I'm going to cut something off, I've got to be going fast. I know where the ball is going. I know the snap count. I need to be winning those, uh, those battles. Okay, so it, it does talk about a gap defender slash zero nose gain leverage, shoot first, ask questions later. Um, kind of popped in my head, but really, at the end of the day, all that's saying is run past the guy and then turn back on him, or run past him and butt block him. Do something where you gain that leverage. Don't think, I've got leverage, I'm going to now turn up and reach him up. Again, the reach happens naturally, the wheel happens naturally, so if I'm trying to force that, again, he's going to pop over the top, it's going to be a waste of whatever I try to do at the start of this, okay? Any B-gap defender, my angle departure is not based on the linebacker, but there, uh, I'll, get to the, I'll get to the footwork, but really, uh, that's going to tell me if I'm going to be really thick on this three technique or this big up defender, if I'm going to be thin uh, based on where my linebacker's at. Okay? When it comes to footwork, any guy in the A gap defender, skip for depth or skate to run, what do I need to do to gain the leverage? Okay? What is this kid really good at? And maybe he's not good at skipping out, but I got spring ball. I'm going to make them learn how to do that really well. And if after the course of spring ball and they're not that good at it, they can probably open up their hip and still run. They haven't. You know, unlearn how to do that skill, okay? Um, B gap defender, skate based on down defender level. So I'm going to skate stab. That's where my wide base is going to come in. So if I'm a play side guard with a two eye or a back side guard with a three, same exact technique. The only difference is instead of a drag hand, we'll call it a pillar, probably semantics. But the pillar, we know I'm not just protecting myself. I'm actually working this guy down, okay? So I'm going to skate. I'm going to get my second step down quickly. I don't want it to be long. It can't be long, as a matter of fact. Okay, I want my hip there with my hand, and I'm going to stick this guy. Now, where's my backer? Okay, so as I stick that guy and move to my backer, he might, the three might try to run with me, uh, but I know I'm buying time for that backside tackle to get it cut off. And also, if, the back, if our, our backer wants to run through on the backside, I've, I've got the three technique wired, so I'm in good shape there, too. All right? Um, <clears throat> Hand placement for these guys, anything in the A-gap. I like this coaching point, pretty similar to what the center did. I want my backside hand to get the far shoulder defender. So if I'm skipping out, I want to take that backside hand. I skip out and take that backside hand, and I want to get it to the far shoulder. I don't know if that's that doable, but at least getting it to the neck. If my backside hand is on his backside shoulder, I will never gain leverage and reach that up. That's just a fact. I mean, if you want to write that one down. I have to get my hand to the other side of the guy and then keep running. That's the only way I'm really going to gain that leverage. We talk about ripping the ripper again. That backside guard could be running a zero nose past the read point. Uh, he could be running uh, a backside shade past the read point, so the running back can cut behind that. But if that guy wants to rip and run, we're going to rip and run. And now we're just really running. 
at the end of the day, right? Not even using our hands on the guy. And the B gap is the backside hand pillar. Where you put the pillar, you got to kind of work this a little bit, but that pillar's got to stick. It can't be elbow, it can't collapse, all that other stuff. I've got to be able to stick something, shoulder, maybe not neck, but somewhere in here I want to stick that B gap guy. Um, so on the coaching points, we won't cut on the backside, probably not all that true. Um, if the defender's running, we want to take a pass to read point. I don't want to cut. I think they're going to end up eventually taking all cuts out of football anyway. That's kind of probably where this whole thing's going. So I want to make that guy go fast so that he can make the tackle and the back can uh, uh, cut off of that. Or I want to stick the guy on the backside, gain the leverage, and let the back uh, go front side or based on where I'm at. So I like the fact, put it this way, when you do cut, you might get the guy cut. He's, he's got to pop up. He's got to get off the ground. He's probably going to jump on that pile, be a part of that play. I know that an offensive lineman laying on the ground is going to take away options for the running back. I don't like that either. So there's enough things that happen in cutting. And probably can't cut in high school all that much anyway, uh, unless the guy is right in front of you. So at the end of the day, just being able to do this with speed, I think, is the best way to do it. Shoot first, ask questions later. I already talked about that. Just running past the defender. If the two-eye crosses face, we'll pass him back to the backside. So really, anything in the A-gap, and I'm trying to get my hand there, he wants to slam backwards, I'm going to stuff that back again to the, to the tackle, and hopefully he's skipping out and getting up too. And then I'm on my way to my backer right now. So we're going to exchange that, that two-eye. It's very rare. In fact, I don't even know that I have a, a situation where that backside tackle just has a free climb uh, to the backside backer. He's always in a, in a four-down look. He's always going to be working with the guard. Um, one thing about throwing the pillar on the three technique, okay, you'll get a, got a lot of guys that'll take the seven, they'll, they'll try to reach back and try to pillar that and then get out. We just tell him, hey, look, I'm going to do this, I'm going to stick that out there. He's not there, I'm not there, okay? If he's there and I feel him, great. But if I don't feel him, I'm not going to reach for him. That means he's already wide enough, or in this case, loose enough for the backside tackle to get him reached up. So, not trying to reach back. I think I got a pretty good clip of that in here, too. All right, so I think we're looking at the right guard here as he takes off. Now, you might say, okay, that's not a pillar. I would agree with you. It's not a straight arm thing. But what he is doing here, and this is, again, this is critical to the play, he's not putting his shoulder on the guy. He's putting his hand on the guy. You see right, well, right here behind the goalpost, his hand's in here. So when it does come time to leave that, he can separate with his hand. He can separate off that. His, if his shoulder's tied in there, he can't separate. He's kind of tied into whatever that down guy wants to do. And in this case, these guys both kind of end up in the same area because he's buying time for that tackle, and the tackle's just trying to you know, squeeze his way in there. But I think that's a good job of just using your hand, getting to the guy, getting cut off, and does a great job taking him all the way across, uh, almost into the, the sideline here. Um... Here we go. This is a good example of not reaching back for this, this three technique. So as you look at this, uh, the, the right guard here puts the hand out. The guy kind of sits there, plays it kind of lazy. He knows the linebacker's running, he gets up the linebacker. Again, he puts two hands out there, not too excited about that. But he does get attached, and he does slow the guy down enough so that he frees him up or doesn't allow him to get in on the play there. Um, but a, good, a really good clip of not reaching back for that stuff. Um, let's see here. Here's a good shot of him understanding, okay, I've basically got a tight three technique and I got, I got a guy in a 20 who's probably there to run pretty fast anyway, so I got to go thin on this. And again, I think this is a great clip of right here, using his hand to separate. He's got his hand in there, he's going to separate so he can get to his linebacker. He is not tying his shoulder into the block. That's a really big deal. Does a good job gaining leverage here. This goes from one hand. I know uh, we end up getting kind of cut back, but he does a great job of uh, uh, gaining his horizontal leverage and keeping it there. All right. Um, let's see here. Left guard in this case. Again, we got a linebacker that we think probably going to run. He uses his hand. You can see him separate there. Doesn't tie the shoulder in. Does a nice job. This guy kind of sits, so he sits. I don't like when we get beat over the top late like that. I think those are 
touchdown blocks when he can keep make the guy play behind you, but he does do a good job of slowing the guy down. I guess we're close enough to the goal line where he can't make it anyway, so good to him. A couple more clips on some of these, I believe. This is a zero, well, not a zero nose, the linebacker kind of standing up in here anyway, um, and how they're, they're kind of playing this bearish type front here. This is not skipping out, this is simply skating and ripping. So he's like, okay, I have to gain leverage no matter what, I strike that. He does overrun this, but he tries to get his butt back in it, and he slows the guy down enough to where he's just not going to make it to the play. That's all good stuff, too. He just understands, hey, this is what I have to do, The back will make me right, and he does in that case. I think we use this clip anyway for the, for the play side guard as well. Um, in this scenario, let's see here. <clears throat> I think this is the left guard. So we have a pretty funky front here. Some linebackers over here. We got nothing in this spot right here, and, and we're running into all this stuff here. Um, not sure who they might doubt. I don't know that I can remember back then anyway. But what does happen here is he's not really thinking that much. He's like, okay, is this guy working inside? He's not. He sees the nose kind of step back at him. He immediately tries to rip and run. And what he does there, and I know this guy, isn't, well, maybe he's ripping him, but he's ripping, saying, okay, all we're going to do now, buddy, is we're going to run. We're going to run, 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 keep some block that way, and really just gives the back a chance to cut back off behind him there. And I thought that was a great job by him. I think I got another clip of him in here doing something kind of impressive. Here's a good look at the same deal now, using the pillar... Slow him down a little bit, separated. Left hand, make the guy go backside. Did a nice job of that, and here we go. This is the impressive clip here, I, I thought. So, his linebacker is number seven here. They're working uh, the three technique to seven, which looks like, oh, excuse me, six now. Looks like it's going to be pretty tough there, because this guy's almost, he's in the A-gap on a play side. So, he goes, he puts the pillar out, he flattens. He rips across, gets his elbow in there, has enough to him to use his hands, gets kind of a jump turn on number six, just a fantastic job here, just opens up a seam for him. I look at some of that stuff and say, boy, I coach the shit out of that, but I, I'm, honestly, this kid is just understanding, I got to gain leverage, I got to gain leverage, okay, I gained the leverage, now the guy wants to fall back, I'm going to jump turn on that, I'm going to settle in there. Just had a really good feel for what he needed to do, uh, based on the pressure of what the linebacker gave him, so... Really nice, nice job by him. The last part of this, and I don't know how I'm doing on time, do you know? We're good? Okay. So the last part of this, backside tackle. Again, you're kind of going into some of the similar things. We're going to try to gain leverage on any A or B gap defender. So if I have a 2I there, that backside tackle should be thinking, I'm going to gain leverage on that. I'm going to, I'm going to get that reached up if we need to cut the defense. Because if a 2I sits there like a, like a bump on a log, yeah, you know, the guard's going to be running past that, and the tackle's going to have to... Uh, pick that up. Uh, skate or skip out for depth. Again, I like the skip out. Hand placement, backside hand to the far shoulder, defender, rip the ripper. All the same stuff we just talked about, okay? Again, we will not cut. He has three steps to overtake hammer and climb. That means any three technique that wanted, or two technique that might be playing that backside guard. Shoot first, ask questions later kind of comes up again. Um, would love to get the B gap defender reached up and driven north, but that's not always realistic. So they, they know if that B gap guy, three techniques, sits there lazy and we can drive him north, that's awesome. That's more options for the back. If he's just reached up and we, and we gain horizontal leverage on him, uh, then we're in good shape that way. Okay? So, final bits of film here. We are looking, I believe, at the right tackle. So he, he was a skip out guy, he really did like that. As he kind of squeezes his way in there, the, the, the guard has to separate as the linebacker presses the line of scrimmage here. And it really kind of turns into a bit of a rip the ripper situation where he just keeps the guy running into the pile there. And he never once, in my mind, never once really tries to turn up and reach this guy. He just wants him going faster and faster and faster. Okay? And once that happens, uh, he can't control himself. Okay? I probably have a few more clips of him going here, but let's see who's on the back side of this one. Or excuse me, here's my skip out right here again. Does a good job of, I want you to look at this, his right hand. So they don't always rip, too, we give him some options there. If ripping's not there, maybe I wipe my way in, I wipe his hands down, kind of soften, 
I'd give up some ground. I think this is a little bit of a wipe here and it gets to the point where it turns into, you can see your late turns into a bit of a butt block there. So we did have, we don't have anything kind of controlling this at this point. I think this was two minute or, or somewhere at the end of the half where this guy was just taking off and chasing, but um, does a nice job there with it. Uh, let's see here. Here's a good look at skipping out. He rips, so shoot first, ask questions later, right? So doesn't really get to touch the guy, rips past him. All of a sudden he's like, okay, I'm past him. I'm just gonna slow it down right now and make turn it into a butt block. Never once again turning up to try and reach this guy up, just knowing, hey, I'm between him and the ball. Okay, I'm between the defender and the ball, I'm in good shape, all right? And it really does enough to, to get the running back all the way to the other side, that's a good job. Couple other ones in here. Um, let's see. Okay, this this cat here, he did not want to skip out, which is fine. He skipped out when he played on on the right side. On the left side, he's like, okay, I'm just going to take off and go. Gets the backside hand to the far shoulder. He does not put it on his back, so he knows where he's got to get the hand to. The guard does a pretty nice job. He has the ability to be thick there. But I did like to show this, basically showing that his backside hand is making it to front side chest or the neck area or something like that. It's not on his backside shoulder. It's a big deal. At least to be able to cut that guy off and gain that leverage. Uh, let's see here. I think we're talking right tackle again here. Uh, cutting off the two technique. Which, oddly enough, I don't know that they're bringing pressure here because uh, this guy kind of plays it. Uh, on the backside shoulder of the guard, but we get the pillar that we want, extension, and he's like, okay, at all costs, I need to gain my leverage, he gains the leverage, the guy loses himself, just really enough to spring the back for the touchdown on that one, and he gets excited about it too. I think that's a pretty cool clip there. Um, his feel for that was, was really good, and um, you know, more guys that can kind of understand that on the backside, um, you know, the more options the back's gonna have, obviously, moving forward. Whoops. One more clip if I can get back to it. Kind of the same scenario. We actually we showed this one too, but just another shot of him skipping out. Nothing mind-blowing here, but I do like his speed. He understood how to get moving here and just tucked himself in there and just keep running with it. Again, not reaching the guy up. So that takes you through um, that takes you through all like play side. Defend, excuse me, play side blockers, which we guard and tackle, and then our backside center guard and tackle. How we do it. A lot of detail in there uh, at the end of the day, but if you go back and say, okay, fundamentally, or, and you're talking about leverage, understanding horizontal leverage, and just knowing that guys got to keep running, how they're going to keep running, kind of understanding some of that, I think you're going to create a lot of options for the back. Um, my email is on here if you have any questions, and that is my cell phone. Um, you know, if you need anything, shoot me a text or whatever. Uh, I don't know that I got a lot of film to send out. In fact, this is obviously Buffalo film, so um, I'm a, maybe a little bit lazy. A lot of stuff going on here in Kansas right now, but it was still good film, and I never really got to show this clinic all that much last year. So um, anyway, thanks again for having me, and I appreciate it. How long did we go for?